Um, but probably not Halibut, because Halibut's its own special business. Um, but anyway, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the things that occurred with the ground fish stocks. We've been through an interesting period um, since, well, I'll, I won't, you'll, you'll see it. You'll see what the interesting period was. And feel free to ask questions, interrupt as you go. Uh, if you're getting too cumbersome, I will ignore you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, overview of the talk, uh, these are the things I'm going to try to go over. This is some items to set the context and the stage. Really, the talk, as the title indicates, is the sort of latter part where we'll look at some ground fish stocks and what has happened to them then and, and what we think has happened now. And, and I've said that I, the title has the word perceptions in it because uh, it is perceptions. We don't really know how many fish there are in the ocean, um, but we have to pretend that we do because that's how we work our business. Um, anyway, yeah, so Jumping right in. For those of you, I'm assuming you don't know very much about fisheries. If you do know a lot about this, Stasis, you should know a lot about this stuff. I'm not, you can just plug your ears, or whatever. So in 1990, I arrived in 1990. Six years later, 1996, we had a reauthorization of the Magnuson Stevens Act, sometimes called the Sustainable Fisheries Act, the SFA, which uh, mandated some changes to fisheries management in the U.S. The Magnuson Stevens Act is the federal legislation established in 1976, which set up our 200 mile limits. We didn't have the 12 mile limits prior to that. A lot of the reason for the, the Magnuson Stevens Act was the fact that there were foreign vessels within sight of land off, off the Newport, and I've heard of them, most uh, coastlines of the U.S. And there was a great deal of concern that we needed to do something. Part of what they did was establish a 200 mile limit. The other thing they did was establish the regional fishery management councils and the, the mechanics that we now have for doing um, fisheries management. The 1996 um, uh, SFA required, mandated that councils had to pay attention and rebuild overfished stocks. We first had to define what an overfished stock was. We did not have definitions of overfished stocks prior to that act. Um, it required total catch accounting, so fish that get caught and discarded at sea, if they are dead, they must be accounted for somehow in the process. And there was also a um, clause or whatever that required or, or promoted the idea of essential fish habitat. And those, those three things are actually caused a lot of ripples through the system for, for years to come. The one that we're really going to focus on is this notion of overfished stocks and rebuilding them. Um, so there, there's the legislation, the Sustainable Fisheries Act, and then there are national standard guidelines that are really the, uh, the rules that are used to implement the law. And the national standard guidelines required that stock assessments uh, determine stock status with respect to fishing. Are we removing fish too rapidly? So that was, that's how we used to do business, only in terms of removals. Were we doing more per year than we should? And in addition, the new thing was whether the stock was below some threshold that was considered overfished. So that, that was a key thing, and prior to 19, about 97 or 8, we didn't worry about whether a stock was overfished. We only worried about whether it was, whether overfishing was occurring. It doesn't sound like much, but it was actually a big deal. Um, a ground fish crisis ensued. Um, just to grab some headlines. So Ron Wyden announced ground fish disaster money that he and Gordon Smith had acquired. Uh, Patty Murray from, say, Washington was similarly out there with begging bowls to get money to help the fishermen and the fishing agencies and everybody else around. California was also in the business. This was a 
this was a big deal. There was a lot of headlines about the ground fish crisis <laughs> because a lot of people were affected by reactions to that were, came into play because of the Sustainable Fisheries Act and the requirements that we suddenly pay attention to whether a stock was overfished and rebuild any that were overfished. Um, so the source of the crisis was official declarations from the National Fisheries Service, now known as NOAA Fisheries, that there were a number of overfished stocks on the U.S. West Coast. And so the little table there has the year in which the stocks were declared overfished and the estimated year at which they would be rebuilt, depending on what rebuilding plan was set in place. And the graph shows the sort of trajectories for these uh, seven rockfish stocks. And it was mostly the rockfishes. Uh, if you know much about our rockfishes, you will know that they are pretty long-lived. Uh, Pacific Ocean perch, which is one of the ones you'll hear about today, they think maximum age might be up to 100 years. Uh, some of the rockfishes live even longer than that. Most of them have lived at least to be 20 or 25. And these are not a salmon. Coho, three-year life cycle, Chinook, a five-year life cycle. These are really different animals. Um, in addition to the rockfish, there was a lingcod stock during the same sort of time period that was declared overfished, and also Pacific eight. So all of a sudden, our West Coast fisheries have been going on pretty much unencumbered by. Well, there were there were regulations and some limits and whatnot, but this this was a big game changer because all of a sudden we had significant numbers of stocks that were considered to be in bad condition and they needed to be rebuilt. Several of these rockfish stocks reside on the shelf in relatively shallow water and there are lots of other animals in that water too. They get they co-occur and get caught with the rockfishes. Most of these rockfish are troll caught fish. Troll gear is not very selective and it's you know it's the net that sweeps the bottom and you're in the path of the net, you're likely to get caught. There's some things you can do about it, but for the most part, you're, it's, not, it's not very selective. So the council was faced with a dilemma. What do they do to make sure that these stocks get rebuilt? The law requires rebuilding of any stock that's declared to be on a fish. And there's certain rules. It has to be within 10 years or uh, the 10 years plus the generation time or something of that nature. And so along with animal, the generation time could be quite long. Um, anyway, the council established, I missed the debate about this. I was, I'm not sure, I wasn't paying attention, but th this was a, an onerous, <laughs> horrible operation to sort of decide how are we gonna do this? And what they decided to do was to shut down the shelf. They basically established closed areas that they weren't marine protected areas. These were rockfish conservation areas that are set up for the explicit purpose of preventing bycatch of rockfish on the shelf where these, these uh, overfish stocks were located. They adjust the boundary shoreward and seaward depending on how things are going and what they think might be uh, impacted badly by whatever fishing is occurring. And these are closures that not just affect commercial fishing, it also affects recreational fishing. So for you know, more than a decade, there's a big chunk of territory off our shores here that has been off limits for Pacific for fishing for a long time now. Uh, a little bit about the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Many of you know about it, but some of you might not. Um, there are these eight regional councils. The Pacific Council is our local regional management council. It has uh, 14 voting members from the states of California, Oregon, and Washington. And I guess you didn't know that Idaho has coastline. Idaho is part of the Pacific Fishery Management Council. It's a salmon. Right? The salmon run from the ocean up past Idaho. So Idaho is one of the voting council members on the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Federal government is represented. And then there, there, there are rules and whatever for who gets on the council. There are 14 members. They're non-voting members from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Coast Guard, and the state of Alaska. And they work hard. The meeting just finished the other week. 
noisy. They're, they're, these are basically week-long meetings that are, they start at 8, they finish at 6 or, or 5 or maybe even later, depending. Um, and they rotate around different locations to give access to the public and the fishing communities. So South Seattle, sometimes Vancouver up in Washington, Boise or Spokane, if we want to go a little bit farther east, Los Angeles, San Diego, Sacramento. San Francisco used to be on the loop as well. But anyway, this it's a big song and dance that's pretty um, a, quite an interesting circus to watch. If you ever have an opportunity, they're in Vancouver, Washington sometimes, which is not too far away. And it's it's pretty amazing. There's a lot of stuff going on. Who pays for those stuff? Yeah, this it's federal government money. So no fisheries. Uh, I'm not sure what the budget items are, but that would be really interesting to know what the cost is. And I, I don't know the cost. So, um, I attend them because I'm one of a sort of advisory body. Um, so this the thing is structured with voting council members, but a lot of the work gets done by advisory bodies and committees. Uh, there's a thing called the Scientific and Statistical Committee that I'm on. Uh, there's enforcement consultants. There's a habitat committee that Walter Wakefield's on. <clears throat> Groundfish Allocation Committee. So those are sort of scientific bodies, enforcement, anyway, it's sort of professional expertise. And then there are advisory sub panels for the different um, categories of fish, so ground fish, salmon, coastal pelagic species are things like uh, sardine and anchovy. I mean, migratory species are things like the tunas, um, the tunas, I guess, oh, squid as well. Uh, and then there's an ecosystem committee as well, as well. And then there are technical teams that do, really do the work. The ground management team, there's a few people from ODF and W that have the pleasure of going to those grinding week-long meetings where they're off and up until the hours to produce something for the next day. It's mind-boggling. A salmon technical team that is also uh, tends to work into the wee hours during the meetings for March and April in order to set the salmon salmon seasons, which start like May first, oftentimes. Um, and anyway, you can you can get the idea. So, bear with me now. I will go through some sort of what is fishery management, stock assessment. What is all this stuff? Why do we do it? Um, stock assessments. What are they? Why are they? Well, the federal law, um, actually, that can, came on uh, later than the Sustainable Fisheries Act, requires that all stocks have annual catch limits set for them. So this is basically a catch quota. You shall not exceed this annual catch limit for everything. We, we have, off of our coast, there are like 60 rock bills. I, there's a whole, I think, like 80, 100. There's a huge number of stocks. This is, if you think about it, trying to just do the bookkeeping for all this is mind boggling, really. Anyway, we, we have to do it. Um, so these annual catch limits have to be based on science somehow. It might be, it's not rocket science, it might be back of the envelope science, but there's something that is fully documented. Why do we need these annual catch limits? Well, uh, here's sort of an explanation. If you catch faster than the rate at which the stock is sort of able to regenerate, it's going to get smaller, right? It's not rocket science. If you have a bank account and you withdraw money faster than your interest rate and the rate at which you're putting it in, the balance goes down. Um, if the stock's biomass is less than a certain amount, and we just use it described as BMSY, then in point of fact, the overall productivity declines. So the BMSY is kind of an important signal point. You want to try to, you don't want the thing to get really small because then, right, it's when your savings account balance is really small. You don't generate much money at all in terms of interest. Well, the fish example, the interest rate changes with the size of the balance. Um, and anyway, We'll see a picture of that in a moment. One of the other things that comes in with these annual catch limits is buffering for scientific uncertainty. So I think the general idea is if it's foggy out, don't drive fast. If the roads are clear and visibility is good, you can drive 
reason with that. It's really pretty basic stuff. Stylized models. What am I talking about? I will go through this, go through this really fast if you want to skip it all together, but I think I won't because I don't do that. Um, so here's a way of thinking about a stock and the vertical scale is sort of annual productivity, tons per year of productivity. The horizontal scale is biomass. How big is the stock? And the, the upside down shape of it indicates here that when there's no biomass, there's no productivity. That's, uh, that's that one's easy. And at some point, even when nothing else is going on, the stock doesn't keep growing. It, it stops growing. So we can think of the vertical scale as growth rate. The growth rate goes to zero when the stock gets to some carrying capacity in sort of ecology literature. And the little diagonal line there is corresponds to the minus F times B. It's, it's what you would remove if your fishing is going on at a certain rate denoted by F. So F is just here a constant. Depending on the size of the biomass, you get a big catch or a little catch, right? And something scales in between. And so growth is the first part of the equation. The harvest is the diagonal line. When those two things are equal to one another, there's no surplus of growth. There's no surplus of removals. The stock doesn't change, right? So it's an equilibrium point, at least theory. And uh, there's a equilibrium biomass associated with that uh, intersection, and there's a peak to that growth upside down parabola, and that's what's usually described as MSY, maximum sustainable yield. We can argue about whether it exists and shapes and all that stuff, but I won't, won't do that. Where's Carmel Finley? Oh, oh she'd be poking in front of me here. But anyway, um, one of the things about this kind of model is that it is. There's no, there's no age structure, there's no individuals. This is biomass, right? It's, there's nothing, we're not counting animals, we're not measuring how big they are, we're just saying what is growth relative to the overall biomass. Um, and so there's two elements of growth. Part of the, one element is new animals, right? New offspring join the population. That's an important thing, but they don't weigh very much, right? So it's like tiny. And another part of the growth is the growth of individuals that are already in the population. They get bigger until at some point they sort of stop growing, right? And so both all of that stuff is subsumed in this simplified model. And I showed you that only so I can show you this, which is really what I wanted to get to, which sort of explains why we use catch quotas for managing fisheries. It's not the only tool, but it's one of the major tools. And the idea is, if we have a fishing rate, we can multiply, call the target fishing rate there in the equation. That's the slope of that diagonal purpley pinkish line. We can calculate what the catch should be. And suppose we say, okay, we're always going to take 10%. It sets the slope of that line. We go out there, we measure the stock size, and we multiply it times 10%, and that's going to be our quota. Now, if we're to the to the right of the uh, green vertical line, then the removals, the catch that we take, is going to be bigger than the growth. The stock gets smaller. Right? It's going to come back towards the green vertical line. If we're to the left of that line, then the catches that we're taking out are going to be smaller than the growth. The stock's going to get bigger over time. So this, this is a sort of feedback control idea. That is the basis for you know, what we use why we use catch quotas in managing fishing. So the idea is we want to try to, if we can measure the stock biomass, the horizontal scale, and we have some idea what that diagonal line's slope should be, we have a rule that says, how do we take our catches and not, we end up at a place that we think is good. And here it's that intersection point. David, isn't it important to point out that the assumption is that everything else is equal? Everything else is con the yeah. that we're talking about here, and that's the only controlling factor. Which yeah. obviously isn't the, the environment is constant, and all I, all else. Yes, right. I'm just I'm just that's good it was point. Something we hadn't touched on, I thought it might be worth. No, that. absolutely, right, absolutely. It, it, so the point is the the environment changes, and really, instead of this nice curve, this curve is actually probably moving around in a variety of different ways.
um, that may or may not be considered in our our simplified world. In fact, that's what was this was leading to here is when we you know we might have it in our head that we want to maximize our catches, and so we figure out what the slope of that pink line should be, and we set it, and that's going to put us right there at the peak of the curve. Every life is beautiful, then we don't have to worry about anything. But if we got it wrong, we thought the stock was up here on this black line, but in point of fact, it was on this lower blue line. Instead of ending up at a good place, we've gone way past a good place, and we're someplace bad. Well, this is one of the issues going on. And point of fact, I think, in my view, that's part of why we ended up at the groundfish crisis, because, because we thought things were a lot more productive than they, in hindsight, maybe turned out to be. But I'm not sure that now our picture's changing again, and that's the, that's in, I'm the skipping ahead. But, um, the council's control rule is more complicated than the pink diagonal line. It's no longer pink. There is a diagonal line there. It's dashed gray, and it's described as the overfishing level, the OFL. And the we, you know, this is part of the the rules we have to abide by now. That we we have to determine an overfishing level, and thou shalt not exceed the overfishing level, basically, in, in the councils. Um, but because we all know that the world is variable, and we don't measure it very well, and we get wrong, things wrong. We, it's required by law that there be a buffer for uncertainty. So instead of using the overfishing level, we actually go with something that's less than the overfishing level. So there's this green dashed line that includes a buffer for uncertainty. But in addition, the council has another kind of portion to its control rule that says if the stock is less than 40% of the unfished level, don't go with the green dashed line, go with this black line, which, just, which declines much more rapidly. And in fact, declines to zero when we're at 10% of unfished. So when, when, if we establish that the stock is down at less than the 10% level, there is no fishing, not allowed, full stop. If you are between 10% and 40%, then you, there's this kink. Right, and there's a different way of calculating the catch quota as a, as a consequence. So this, this, is the, this is the system that the council uses. A stock assessment plays into this because there's two things it's trying to do. One of them is to try to figure out where are we on the horizontal scale? What's the stock status with regard to biomass? Are we up greater than 40%? Or are we less than 40%? Are we above 10%? Where are we? And the other task is, what's the slope of the diagonal line that kind of sets everything, right? Uh, it, I call it the target rate for fishing. And, and if you think back to the earlier diagrams, if we, you, know, you, you can get to set that slope. And depending on what you set it at, you're going to get a different catch. So it becomes pretty important. Both of those are the tasks of stock assessments. Sort of, it's a, analogous to a bank account. A bank statement, right? You go to your bank statement. It's going to tell you how much money you got in the bank. I mean, that's the stock side. <clears throat> it's also going to tell you, assuming it's an interest-bearing account, what your interest rate is. That's analogous to the harvest rate, the target fishing for the stock assessment. Both of those are at play when people prepare stock assessments. <clears throat> and those go into a formal framework that tries to do the accounting. Age one fish become two, age two the next year, and three the year after, and so on. And we partition the catches up into the fraction that are each of the different ages. And we have a matrix then of catches at age and by year. And the stock assessment model is a formal uh, framework for analyzing changes over time in the age composition of a stock. And there's a little equation that's there and whatnot. You don't need to worry about it. They're, they're data that go into these stock assessments for landings and discards. There's going to be age composition information, something to do with weight and age, so we can translate numbers of fish to weight, because most of our units are actually biomass, tons of fish. 
we need to know something about maturity. So what fraction of the age one fish are mature, twos and threes and so on. Uh, and we probably have surveys that are conducted to give us estimates of changes in biomass, if not absolute biomass, uh, age composition, all of these good things. And so that goes into this complicated thing. And normally I have a black screen on the top of it and I open the black box up. Anyway, there's, it is a black box pretty much. And then it's, it, but it outspits a bunch of numbers that describe the assessments reconstruction of what happened in the past. This part of the, most of the assessment is hindcasting. How did we get to where we are given all the things we've seen? that have, we've accumulated data over. What's the best way to account for that? This is, it's an accounting exercise. Once we have that accounting, we can project forward, and that's a, that's a different task, but that's part of an assessment usually as well. And just to kind of make it even more complicated, this, this is sort of a, a schematic that illustrates what goes on. Uh, the left-hand panel, the, those are little bubbles. It's called a bubble plot. And the size of the bubble is proportional to the abundance of fish. And we've got ages going up and years going across. And on the diagonals, those are cohorts, year classes of fish. This is actually from the 2016 um, Pacific Hate stock assessment. Pacific Hate go through wild fluctuations because sometimes there are, they, sometimes you don't walk on. I mean, there, there, there'll be year classes that are huge, 100 times bigger than the other ones, or even, or even more. So there's huge variations over time, depending on whether there's been a good year class or not. This is not constant. Things are, things are definitely highly variable. So it, the, the diagram <laughs> illustrates the little diagonals are that some big year classes. There's 1980 was a big year class, 1984. 1999, and there have been some bigger ones also recently here. You can see the bubbles, right? The bubbles tell you where the big pulse is of the age class within a year. And this, this is part of the output of the model, not the input. What's going in would be things like catch at age compositions. Uh, and then there's weak feedback from the size of the spawning portion of the population and the resulting offspring. Right, you don't get eggs from no parents, right? You have to have parents to have eggs. So fundamentally, there's got to be some connection, but it's really, really weak. It's really, really loose. So and this is not an atypical diagram. These little dots are the actual sort of predictions. The bars, the whiskers try to show you the sort of uncertainty associated with them. And this is the sort of average, this black line down here. But you're almost as likely to get a really big year class from lots of biomass as from very little biomass, uh, which makes it complicated. Okay. Oh, and the, how you get to that, that was output. What, how you get there is from inputs. So the inputs here are the age composition data, the actual observations from fisheries of the proportions at age and the uh, author color-coded things, fortunately, so that you can see the year classes. Uh, so here's the, this pur purpley, whatever fuchsia color is, some year class or other, 2001 maybe, or 2000 year class. Probably, it's probably the 1999 year class, actually. Barely showed up at ones. But then you can see them. And so here's another big year class. So the bars are the data. The predictions, you can barely see, but that's a little dot. But those are the predictions. And the, this is a statistical model. It's basically trying to figure all the parameters that provide some best fit between the observations and the predictions. Well, it's just like regression, but it's just a complicated regression. So enough, enough of that. But now behind us now, get to something a little bit more digestible. Boccaccio, we're going to look at four overfished stocks that were considered overfished during this time period, 1999 through 2001, 2002. This plug of, slug of uh, stocks that suddenly got uh, declared overfished, wreaked havoc on things. So these are some, I'm just going to illustrate some results from the assessments. 
and we will see a sort of then and now kind of comparison. So the 1999 assessment, uh, I couldn't get a good snapshot of the graph in the actual assessment. I can't remember why they did some weird thing on the graph. But anyway, here, so I recreated it from the numbers I could get. And so this dashed line I forgot to label is the 25% of unfished line. It's called the minimum stock size threshold, MSST. And when you get below that line, you are overfished. You got to do something. That's the rules, federal rules. Uh, and so this is the assessment taking place in 1999 that says, oh, we've been overfished for two decades, uh, which was not great. <coughs> um, and the median time to rebuild this stock from the initial rebuilding analysis was it was going to take 23 years to get back to 40%. But the rules are when you go below 25%, you're declared overfished. You can't get out of that until you get back to 40%. There's an asymmetry in the way the system's set up by design. I didn't design it. But anyway, that's what it is. So you have to work really hard to get it back up to the 40% target as quickly as possible. So that was the, that, hold that picture image in your mind. Here's the 2015 assessment. There have been several in between as well. We'll see some of those in a moment. The scale has changed here. We, we The council typically does the stock determination on the basis of relative to unfished. So this is all scaled relative to unfished. One is unfished. And so this is the reconstruction in 2015 of what the 1999 thought had happened. We'll see a, sort of on top of each other in a moment. Um, but this Reconstruction says, whoa, this stock is doing all sorts of things. It's pretty stable back in here, mainly because we don't have no data. But as soon as we actually have data in the 60s, we have evidence of year class pulses. And so there was evidence of some strong year classes that, in fact, drove the biomass above the average unfished level. And then it took a plummet, uh, and, but it barely dipped below the minimum stock size threshold and actually got above it probably in 2001 or two thereabouts. And it's been sort of hovering uh, uh, between it and the, um, the management target of 40%. In point of fact, it got above the management target, but that point's not shown on this graph. That's why it was declared rebuilt uh, as a result of the 2015. Am I right or am I misremembering? Oh, uh, the 2017 up, yes, it was still overfished in 2015. Thank you, Stacey. Stacey's going to keep me honest here. That's good. Okay, so anyway, that's the reconstruction. Um, and here's all of the stock assessments are, are, in theory, supposed to produce a kind of all of the assessments on top of one another so you can see how things have changed. I mentioned how the council has a buffer for uncertainty, and the way they actually measure the buffer is by doing an analysis of these kinds of things to see how our perception changes from one assessment to the next because we know we don't do it right ever probably, but we, you know, we hope we were on average somewhere close. So you can see, and I don't know the scales for the, this is metric tons. So this, yeah, okay, so this, this, this graph here is spawning output. That's going to be millions of eggs, whereas this graph is biomass. So they, they had to do some things, but you can see <laughs> From one assessment to the next, things change a lot. The 2015 assessment is the black line. The, 20, uh, the 1999 assessment is this red line, right? It ends in 1999. And, and these are the assessments that have occurred in between. And you, so you can see our, our reconstruction of what happened back in the 70s can differ quite a lot depending on the assessment. And I mean, this, this is, I get, I get excited about this thing, but I know you guys don't, so that's fine. Uh, so next stock, canary rockfish. These fish are beautiful. I, the one field project that I've got involved in in the 20 plus years I've been here was with these guys. They're, they're beautiful fish. Anyway, canary rockfish um, curl off our coast. It's a it's a, a pretty sizable resource too in terms of numbers of 
amount of biomass. <clears throat> this is the 1999 assessment. I, I just prepared this slide this morning. I'm really scratching my head because this is amazing. So this this a 1990 assessment, 1999 assessment, had the stock below the minimum stock size threshold way back, even in the 60s, the mid 60s. There was a huge fishery going on in the 50s and early 60s. So it's not implausible, but I was surprised. I did not realize that this was the case. Um, anyway, so here's the, here's the picture, right? The minimum, this is when you drop below that yellow line, you're overfished. So the assessment was redone in 1999, and it puts it down like 4% or 5%, some really ungodly low number. Um, and the rebuilding analysis that was conducted said that without fishing, it would not rebuild until 2053. That's still several decades away. Here's the 2015 assessment that was conducted. Pretty different picture. Now, again, the scale is different. So this is unfished, unfished, unfished. You know, it's basically up at the unfished level. It drops very quickly. The fisheries on our coast, the trawl fisheries, basically started during World War II. Uh, and they really built up big time in the 60s, uh, post the, well, in the 60s and 70s. One of the consequences of the, of the Magnuson-Stevens Act was money, cheap <laughs> money, to build fishing boats so that we could justifiably displace the foreigners. So there was a huge building boom of fishing boats that came in post-1976, uh, and that spurred a lot of the you know, increased catches that created some of the problems that we're looking at here. Um, anyway, so this assessment has the stock dipping below the minimum stock size threshold for maybe a decade uh, between uh, maybe the mid, uh, well, maybe 1990 to about 2000, and then it's up above. And it actually, according to this assessment, it would have rebuilt in about 2003 or four or five, somewhere in there. These are the comparisons of all the assessments that have occurred. I'm actually, I was the author of these two outliers. Uh, that go figure. <laughs> anyway, um, I, and I don't, some of these numbers don't really make sense to me, but uh, it's water over the dam or under the, under the bridge over the dam, one of the ones for both. Um, again, illustrating that our perception is a perception and it changes. We hope we're getting better as we learn more, certainly our, we have more data, which helps, and we have maybe better tools and better knowledge, maybe, hopefully. Anyway, you can see the 2015 assessment was quite, that's this sort of pinky one here, was quite different than the one just preceded, that just preceded it. And why? Why? Good question. I don't know, without going to the more details of the assessment, probably there were some strong recruitment events that are driving things up. Part of it is a, strange parameter that's described as steepness, which I won't go into because that's, that's a whole nother talk. Um, but you know, there are assumptions underlying these things. Some of the fundamental assumptions kind of go back to uh, this picture, sort of ba uh, fundamental assumptions about the Steepness. Steepness is basically similar to the slope of the, the origin of this curve. And if you get that wrong, you know, it's going to do things. Another real simple question. So has the data collection changed over that time? How reliable is your comparison going backwards if the data collection? Well, the data in the old days is still being used in these days, almost always. There's some exceptions to that. But the catch and age, you know, basically we're, we're being driven by this stuff. Right, these changes in age composition. So we reconstruct what happened 20, 30 years ago based on all the catches that have accumulated since because those fish that entered the fishery as five-year-olds 20 years ago are only 25 now, right? They're still there. These are long-lived animals. So there's a record in the, in the population of those past events. So you don't get rid of those data. Just, I'm sorry to drive Yeah, no, it's okay. I just assume that we're collecting data a little bit differently now than we did 25 years ago. Well, we, specifically, like 
but even the idea of how we're collecting odalisks to determine the age structure of the population and how much effort we're putting into it in, in regards to what we did in the past. Yeah, maybe, maybe it depends. It's going to depend on the fishery. In some cases, maybe we're getting better. In some cases, we're probably not collecting as much as we used to. Oh. So, and there, you, you think of it this way too. If that's what you're scoring, I'm, I'm oh, okay. repeating the right. questions. Oh, thank you. I have not been repeating the questions for our Adobe Connect friends. I apologize. It's been a, anyway, yeah, yeah, Michael. <coughs> Yes. Yes. On the stroke of one pink line. On the stroke of one pink line. <laughs> hey. And there's no, there's no kind of old school psychology going, no, 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 no. That's all the other stuff is. We don't believe that. There's no that going on. There's a lot of people saying we don't believe that. But there were a lot of people saying we don't believe that 20 years ago when it was declared overfished. I mean, anyway, it's. This is somewhat black art. It's somewhat science. We try to maintain some discipline in the discussions and whatnot, but it's uh, there are a lot of fundamental assumptions there. And I think if you look hard at any science, you'll find similar, you know, whatever warts there. But uh, there are some big warts. Yes, we don't. There's some things, crucial things we don't know. It is not easy to determine natural mortality. How many unfished stocks do we have out there so we can go out and measure the catch age structure and determine the mortality rate of an unfished population? Anyway, um, yep. Well, I this this is not the graph, yeah, yeah. I, I, I would need to pick up a, big, a different graph to sort of put it on the depletion scale so that we scale them all back to unfished and then line up all the unfished to really see how they line up. But I, I don't recall offhand, but I think the 2011 assessment didn't have it far off from being rebuilt. Um, I may, may be wrong about that. Let me, let me carry on. Then we have lots of questions. <laughs> widow rockfish. I got, I got widow. Look at that. I got two more to do. I'm going to get through them. So widow rockfish is a little interesting thing here, a little article about, so, so we, we shut down, we have really tight quotas on these overfish stocks. Well, when there's a really, when there is a big quota, and in fact, in, uh, well, if you get a big catch, what are you going to do with it? You're not allowed to bring it in. It goes overboard. This was an overboard dump of widow rockfish from somebody inadvertently catching a big toe and they all drifted into them on the beach um, at Long Beach in Washington. Anyway, all hell broke loose after that happened. But um, so here's Widow Rockfish. This was a little bit of a different picture than the other that we saw here. But so here's the 19, 2000 assessment, unfish level somewhere around 30,000. And this is again, millions of eggs is the way they're measuring things. Uh, here's the minimum stock size threshold in it just got below the minimum stock size threshold, very close to when the assessment was done. But it was overfished. Boom, that's what happens. That's interesting. You don't like what I'm saying. So giving me some, you know, this. Anyway, um, oh, and so here, this one, you can see the median time to rebuild is 12 years. So the prediction was it would be rebuilt by 2013. <laughs> Here's the 2015 assessment with error bars around it. Uh, unfished level, so again, this is the depletion scale, the same sort of bump up. But I draw your attention here, this is the target, 40%. Here's the minimum stock size threshold. Assessment says we never were overfished at all with this one. Um, anyway, here's the comparisons. And this one's a little bit complicated because the black and the brown, the ones that are high, are in terms of spawning biomass, and the others are in terms of spawning output in terms of eggs. So they're not the same scale. It's really just, just think about it in terms of the patterns, and the, the patterns are certainly not dissimilar between them all, although the scale is pretty different. And if you look at this pattern, you know, each year we're sort of creeping to a different place in terms of 
our perception of what's going on with the stock. Last example, we'll be, we'll be able to have time for some serious conversation. Pacific Ocean Perch. This is this one is just assessed this summer. In fact, the book has not been closed on it yet, <laughs> but we're almost there. And I put in these nice pictures of some foreign fishing vessels. Pacific Ocean Perch was the poster child for the West Coast up here in British Columbia and Alaska. This they were hit hard by the foreign fleets, and it wasn't just one country. There were fleets from a number of countries that were targeting these very abundant rock fishes that the America, us Americans have just not tried to get much of. So these foreign, these are pictures from that I got from Bill Barsh. I think he was the photographer. Uh, this was offshore up here, not, probably not that far off. Twelve miles is not very far off. Um, and mostly they were catching Pacific Ocean perch. This is not this is not a new pic. This is a new picture, not an old picture. This is actually from up in Alaska someplace. And they are an abundant stock still up in Alaska. We are at the southern end of the range of Pacific Ocean perch, and so anyway, we are. Um, here's the 1998 stock assessment. Uh, same sort of pictures, you know. We were sort of at some higher level. This uh, very rapid decline was the foreign fishery. They took a huge quantity of, of the cumulative removals. Some a ridiculously large amount came out in a period of about four or five years, of, at, you know, between the mid 60s and the late 60s. Just they hit it really hard. So there's that big decline. The minimum stock size threshold estimated by this assessment was at that. Uh, dashed um, horizontal line. Um, median time to rebuild for this stock was estimated, given no fishing was estimated to be about oh, a couple years ago in, in 18 years. This one has been slow to recover, except the new stock assessment came in this past summer and said, what, what the heck, we, we never even got this stock below 40%. And it got nowhere near the minimum stock size threshold. Now, one might imagine that this was slightly controversial. Yes, it is slightly controversial. And the controversy has not been settled. There's a meeting next Thursday to discuss some additional work that the stock assessor was asked to look at. So jury's still out on this one. Uh, and here's the sort of the comparison pictures. Um, this is the black line is the 2017 assessment. The dashed black line, dotted black line, is that 2017 assessment with a different parameter value for this thing called steepness, which is quite influential. Uh, and so you can see the steepness changes the whole scale of things and drops it quite a bit, although it still doesn't say we were ever overfished, as I recall. And the older assessments are these other lines. And you can see they're, 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 they went down and they stayed down and they haven't come back up again. So some other some of the other rockfish, there were three others. Calcot is a Southern California stock that we don't hardly catch any of. They get really big. Uh, they're really a recreational caught fish as much as anything. It's sort of big trophy, gigantic like group we're trying to find. Uh, it was assessed uh, most recently in 2014, uh, and that assessment said it was at 33.9%, so still below the rebuilding target, but projected to be rebuilt next year, or two years, roughly. Um, dark blotched rockfish was assessed this year with what's called an update assessment, which is sort of add new data and turn the crank. And it just barely got over 40%. And it's been declared rebuilt. Yellow eye rockfish is another problem child. Um, it's slower. It's a very long lived, slow growing animal. And we don't get data now because there's no fishery. So probably know that much about yellow eye. Anyway, the 2017 assessment has the <coughs> depletion at about 28.4%. And its rebuilding plan will be reviewed next Thursday at the same meeting when we will look at the Pacific Ocean Perch um, revisions uh, for a second time. And then my last slide is a postscript to the groundfish crisis. 
more than fish stocks were affected by the crisis. So these two graphs are from a trawl catch share program review that's been going on for the past year or so. And the left one shows the different states, Washington, Oregon, California, the number of fish buying stations and the decline in particular in the number of fish buying stations during the basically the past three decades, or two decades, whatever that is. Um, when there are no fish, when you can't catch the fish, whatever fish are there because they're quotas, um, sometimes you can switch to something else. Some fishermen have been able to do that, but sometimes you're basically, you know, you've got, you got to find a different means of employment. Um, so th there's the decline in the number of fish being, buying stations. There's been consolidation to some extent, but there's also been, you know, a significant reduction in the overall um, activities of, of fishing. Uh, here's the things in terms of fish purchases and millions of pounds. So the, the ground fish crisis was basically here. It, you see a huge dip. Um, all of a sudden, the, the, the shelf was closed. Many of the rockfish stocks that had been, not a major portion, but a significant portion of the, of the landing were off the table um, and people found something else to do. Anyway, that, here's my last slide. Anyway, if you have questions, I'd be pleased to carry on the discussion. I will, I will save John for next. I'll start with this. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Hey, my question was, what's your assessment for diving and biomass in metric tons? So age and size of the area is like a big factor. No, I need to replace the juniper miles by using some of those. So basically, you can have it, absolutely, and the, the, the assessment, the accounting system definitely keeps track of that. <clears throat> but to summarize things, it's just easier. The metric we use because fish are weighed, right? They get, fishermen get paid by the pound of fish. We, we every, everything's converted to pounds. Any idea on the average age of when they're pulled up and It really depends on the species. Yeah, I mean, so I think canary rockfish are mature, maybe about eight or nine. Widow, I think they're a little bit younger. Uh, Pacific Ocean perch are a bit older. Uh, yellow eye, I think like maybe yeah. 18, <laughs> late teens, something maybe. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty variable. And there, there's some rockfish species. Uh, is, is it short? Um, well, the, the yeah, short rank are really long lived. There's some that are really short lived though. What's the what's the one that's the sort of semi pelagic? It's sharp chin. It's a sharp chin. Anyway, their rock fishes are incredibly diverse. And they are really successful genus and they have found their niches lots of different ways. So there's some that are short lived, pelagic, they're swimming around they think they're sardines, and there are others that think they're, you know, oak trees or something and swim forever and barely move. So it Depends. Jody and then John. You like your you like your canary graph. <laughs> okay. This one? Yeah. So your last five assessments give completely different results for everything that was going on between 1920 and 1940. And your data clearly hasn't changed. So your algorithms must have changed. The, the, algor the, 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 the stock assessment model, the, the statistical framework has not changed, but there's some key parameters that probably did change. One of them is this thing I call the steepness. That's pretty key. The other one is natural mortality. And so is that, does that have to do with fishing pressure? No, they have to do with biology. The biology, so the understanding of the fish biology has changed in the last, 10 years to some change extent, that parameter. To some extent, it, to some extent, yes. I mean, I, I don't think we ever have really thought we knew these things very well, but the, those two parameters that are pretty key are generally coming, information from them is coming, is being borrowed from other stocks. So there's a thing called a meta-analysis that people do. And so there have been meta-analyses for a bunch of rockfish stocks where they've been able to estimate the steepness parameter and 
based on that, the best information is a sort of average composite of that uh, overstating how it works. Well, I mean, obviously what we care about is the right side of the graph, but your left side of the graph is really changing a lot still. Yes, absolutely, so, Jody. And believe me, this, this is when, for example, with Canary, one of these Canary things was an update assessment where they revised the historical catches from back in the 50s and 60s. And things changed. And, and this is a tightly knit thing. Uh, and I'm trying to find a good explanation. Basically, your natural mortality and your steepness are saying to the model, how much growth did we lose by catching fish in the past that we're now allowing to be there in the population? Catches don't change, right, for the most part. So we're reconstructing. Because of things that we assume or we think we know differently now, our, the, the model's interpretation of what, what happened in the past to get us where we are now changes. And it goes, goes okay. does this stuff. It's a bit frightening. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get John and then I'll come. So I guess my question is really a continuation of the same question. So you didn't really say very much about why you think that weirdness is happening. You have an opinion. I mean, the, the, other, the other part of it is these fish have such different life histories and things, and yet you look at the whole trajectory of your top, they're almost all the same. Well, remember, it's, 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 a, it's a troll fishery. Trolls are not selective. So if these fish are schooling together or in this close, relatively close proximity, if, but if you pull the trolls off, then shortly you're going to start to pull them out and just yep. do their own thing. That's true. Uh, well, what, the one thing that I guess I would say is that all of, almost all of our assessments show this response in recent years. But shell has been shut down for more than 10 years, 12 years, 14, whatever it is. This is the prime habitat, the prime real estate for many of these species. We have not been fishing at all in that prime real estate. So it's, it would be really a surprise if they didn't show this kind of response. It's really a, it's a question of how rapidly have they come up. And the rapidity with which they come up is partly driven by the, some of the parameters that we assume going in. But that they would have come, the models cannot do anything but predict that they will, if you've been removing fish and you stop removing fish, these models only predict growth. They cannot keep going down. That does not have to that statement about you know protecting the shell, I mean fishermen are resourceful and they find new ways to improve the catch and push and correct things that work. And so do you think that that statement stands that that um, the the curve must do that having closed the shell because fishermen behavior changes as you said, my knowledge changes as you said, understanding of where the stocks are, ability to catch fish. Well, if the, think of it this way, if the, if the rockfish only lived in the RCA, it's fully protected. There would have been no removals, except for the few fish that stray outside the RCA. Well, if you, and this is essentially an unfair stock, and this had been fished, but the, the models do not, do not even contemplate the idea that there isn't growth. Animals grow. They reproduce, babies are born, they grow. Biomass increases if you're not removing them. So it's just that has to happen. Bill. So this is a <laughs> section of size, but I'm really interested in the rigor core process and the uh, enforcement of quotas. So in particular, uh, we recently you know quote quotas for brown fish. Mm -hmm. But that was in response to specifically the black rock fish being lacked. Like 25% of their quota during the summer? Reduction. Yeah. But I mean, it was, it was a very, it was a uh, seasonal uh, fishing pressure. And I thought it was a lot to board, regardless of uh, the rest of the fishing council. Specifically, what I'm asking, um, because other people have asked, was if, if we change um, the regulatory uh, process in the sense that we allow fishing at different depths specifically deeper 
where you don't find black hawkfish, it wouldn't impact, how do you think it would impact the other ground fish? And I, I can't answer that question very easily. Then Matt is probably answer it, but I think the answer is yellow eye. And that the deeper water, there's more yellow eye rockfish. And yellow eye are still considered to be threat, right? well, not threat, and that's, that has implications for ESA. <laughs> right, I'm sorry, <laughs> right, 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 right. I thought they were so, somewhat unfishable, you know? Uh, unfishable in that you're not supposed to fish them. They certainly get caught. Right, yeah. but then that's why, you know, we use, poly, we use the, uh, the descender. The descender, yeah. yeah. But I mean, if people ask, Yep. Bottom line is, what should I tell folks if the regulatory process right now, yeah. you know, closure of the whole round fish and then we open it up again, what is the impact? Well, they are trying to open a long feeder fishery out there, which mandates that basically your first hook has to be a certain distance on bottom. And you basically avoid yellow eye because you can just target the semi pelagics out there, the widows, the yellow stone, the stocks are huge. And so that's kind of the regulatory question that you're hearing fully around a lot right now. Is that's interesting. Yeah, so that's been in the works for a while. I've been getting yeah, it's been a long time. Yeah. This hasn't gotten here yet. But anyway, yes. Yeah, so that's so, the hope a lot of people are talking about for going offshore is this new way of fishing is basically you're not fishing the benthic rockfish, just the sound. You'd be fishing the yellow tail. And widows. Yeah. And widows. Yeah. Oh, and deacon. Yes. And deacons. Yes, that's true. No, there's a few. There's, there's a few. Yeah, yeah, there's a few species. Yes. Are are Fishermen kind of aware of how these will change from year to year and how it was said that something was overfished and then you're looking, you know, 20 years down the line and, and you find that it the, was. The ones that are paying attention are definitely have had some words to express. Yeah, do you think that that kind of contributes to maybe their, like, resistance to... Our fishermen, uh, I suppose, have been extremely, I don't place it not by any means, but extremely... Uh, willing to work through the process and try to come up with a solution to this. I think they realize uh, there's a lot of forces out there that have an impact on their industry. So there, for a while, there was a huge push to ban trawling. And so they, uh, there, there's, there's lots of things they realize that they can't be the trawlers. They just realize they can't be too obstinate about their views and what they should or shouldn't do. They, they, it's a, it is a common property resource. This is everybody's resource. And the council process is set up so that all the people that are affected can have a voice if they if they care to speak at the process. So it's, it's, it is a circus. These council meetings are all sorts of stuff going on at once, but don't things get done. Maybe not done as well as we'd like, but it is not a simple Tabs. These these are these 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 fish are not trees that don't move. You can't count them. You can't see them. It is not trivial to do. Stacy. Can I just follow up with that too? That after the '99 and you know early 2000s, we implemented <coughs> the Star Panel in Tuscaloosa, which is a week long, very rigorous, depending on who your chair is. Sometimes very, very good. <laughs> um, but it's a week long review of the models and the data, and it's open to the public. And so there was a lot of effort to make it more the science more transparent and um, also make sure that it's the best available science. And so I think that that actually helps a lot with the industry and stakeholders to buy into the science. And it's not perfect, and there is still a lot of uncertainty. But they at least have a place to go to get that information and understand what the, you know, the when people are pulling the various levers, what's going on. Yeah, I think so they, I think that was a huge improvement in the process. They 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 feel the implications of these closures. They they it hits them right in their pocketbooks. So they they definitely are paying attention. Mm -hmm. Paul, um, <clears throat> first thing is uh, there's a list of rock. In these mixed stack fisheries. And what number is, I think by the number right ballpark is about 30% where we do a basically assessment of them? Well, all of them sort of have an assessment, but in terms of, you know, something that's like that diagram yeah. with all the bubbles, we, 
those are relatively limited. Yeah, okay. So I'm not sure what the percentage yeah, is. Stacey might know. I would, off the top of my head, I'd say 30 to 35. We're, we're actually increasing as we okay. go, but. Okay, so this is where the logic train has to be. Yeah. And so if we also have a direction to use ecosystem based management, which was a big deal that should have been incorporated a little bit larger in the policy as well as fully for the council and the direction of the council, which I consider very positive. So here you've got two thirds where we have no clue. One third that we're doing okay and definitely heading in the right direction. Yeah. That's good news. So in the council, since we have this large RCA and it's going to be in a transition, and is there a little less discussion about saying we should surely establish some long-term research areas for these different primary habitat types and, and secure them so we and, can study the suite of species, the 60 plus, and, in a robust way. And let's have that dialogue. There, there hasn't been, a, that's probably coming because we're doing a five-year review of the EFH, the Central Fish Habitat study. And there's proposals out there now on the table to, to remove the RCA. Yeah, I know that's what I mean. And so uh, there's certainly room for discussion, and I'm sure it's getting some discussion. I haven't been part of those discussions personally. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, you raise a good point. Paul. So, well, some very special areas have been identified. Yeah. Right? Let's hope there's a good, robust discussion yeah. about protecting those. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, and I think, as I understand it, I don't think the trawlers are. I think they recognize that the rock piles and various other things that are not, not going to get back into. They're, they're not, they, one of the rules that came in place I hadn't thought about was changes in gear regulation. Right. So there used to be gear that they could drag off a very rough bottom. And they, they are not allowed to fish that kind of gear anymore. So I mean, if you don't mind losing a, ten, a chance of losing a ten or fifteen thousand dollar net, you know, have at it. But I mean, they, they, yeah, these guys are businessmen. They, Risks and rewards, or they well understand the risks and rewards of doing something stupid. Anyway, I, I'm well. Charlotte Scarlett has a question from the peanut gallery over there. Oh. So, <coughs> the online gallery. who's a little unfamiliar with fisheries, and she was asking about uh, the 200 mile limit uh, started when the Mag Magnus and Stevenson Act of 1976, and asking if you could elaborate on it. Well, prior to 1976, our, our, our national limits were out to 12 miles. That was it. It didn't extend beyond 12 miles. So the U.S. had no jurisdiction. Now, this kind of goes back to how far can you shoot a cannon? I, 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 basically, you know, you, you, it's yours if you can defend it. If you can't defend it, it's not yours. Wasn't the EUD actually implemented by the 1981 presidential uh, proclamation that uh, declared um, that because the EUD, the 200 mile limit, was kind of um, put forward, as I recall, um, but not adopted with the uh, with the whole. Um, so I think it was actually Reagan in 81. You, you may be right. You may be right, Greg. I, I didn't know that. I thought it was part of the Magnus and Stevens Act, but I may be wrong with that. Yeah, it's a convention of the Right, but that wasn't actually fully adopted. There are two countries that have never signed on to that. And, and that's the US and Nevada. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I recognize the 200 miles, as you said, even though right. it's not the only time I've ignored it. Okay, but we established our 200 mile fishing laws, irrespective of signing on to that. That's right. Mm -hmm. and the rest of the world accepts that. Yeah. In, interesting story in my marine fisheries class. We, we, we looked into some of these things because uh, there's, a, there's a history. There, it's really an interesting history. Certain nation states said, We want to protect our fish. And they just unilaterally said, We're going to extend the boundaries. And eventually, kind of all the other nations of the, uh, on the earth took, you know, went ahead and did the same things. Had a big impact here in Newport. Yeah. Huge. Well, all sorts of impacts. Both, both the fact that we got rid of the foreigners and also the fact that we pumped huge amounts of money in the fishing industry to build boats to displace the foreigners. All of a sudden, we had more boats than we needed, right? We were buying back boats for yeah. a decade. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Just, 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 lots of 
American boat seizures down there in Chile in mm -hmm. the 70s. Yeah, right. And they said, Chile extended. Yeah. They were one of the early nations that extended their boundaries. Just you know, Larry, no. You, you are gone, partners. Yeah, anyway, thank, I, I, I want to go. You guys want to go. Thank you very much. <laughs> I might try to answer them, but I thought I would go ahead and run them by you. One was, are there penalties for species declared overfished and not being enforced by the cargo? It's not like any size of the panel. I think the panel is the same. I think the council. Oh, the council. Yeah. 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 It's still recording. We can just okay, okay. It. Oh, okay. Did you hear that, in, Stephanie? In terms of uh, okay, good. fishermen don't get penalized. The council, I don't know that there's mandates, legal mandates, but if a council knowingly exceeds limits, they could be taken to court. And the National Fishing Service. I don't know then uh, oh, yeah. or, I don't know how that works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the other question was, um, so we were talking about all the different models that were lined up and some were off and whatever. During that discussion, she was asking, are these done by the same agency? And I told her, no. Okay, good. I was like, I'm pretty sure David did two of them. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's kind of all the different ones. Over and they don't even have the same scale, but yeah, you know, yeah. I just wanted to yeah. make sure I answered that correctly. Yeah. It shouldn't be answered is for you. Okay. I think we're good. Everybody good on mine? Yeah. All right, guys, we're gonna go ahead and end if you have other.